whether in the presence of God once again. And uh, uh, once again, I greet you all in the master's name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we have a man of God with us uh, to share the word of God. So before that, uh, uh, I will request uh, uh, Jostan to come forward and uh, uh, Jostan is going to introduce our, our, our I mean, guest speaker today. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I thank Lord for this uh, wonderful morning. Come together in Lord's presence to praise him and worship our almighty God. Our God is a mighty God. Our God is a great God. And we are coming together here because he has done great things in our life. Like uh, Psalms uh, 103 says, I uh, want to uh, read you know, five verses from, uh, from the beginning. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with the love and compassion. Who satisfies your desire with uh, good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord. That's why we are here to remember what the great things, you know, Lord done in our life. Um, what the third verse says, He forgives all our sins and heal all our, all our diseases and redeem your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. And the Lord, our God is uh, who satisfies our desires with the good things so that your youth is renewed like, a, like an eagle. Praise the Lord. Is our life is renewed today? Is our heart is renewed today? Is our mind is renewed today? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Is our uh, uh, faith and hope increased better than yesterday? Praise the Lord. So we are here, sit down and worshiping. While we are sitting down and worshiping God, remember all the uh, blessings and uh, favors He done in our life and uh, uh, praise Him and worship Him. He is worthy to be praised. Praise the Lord. So let's open our heart, open our eyes and open our ears what God wants to speak to us through the uh, servant of God. And it's a great privilege and honor to introduce Pastor George Matthew in our midst this morning uh, as uh, uh, some of you know that you now he's uh, my nephew um, my oldest brother brother's son uh, George, George George Institute uh, that's his dad's name uh, so it is uh, very glad that uh, uh, George is in our midst and uh, speaking to us through the word of God uh, I have a lot of memories and stories I wanted to say but uh, I'm not uh, taking time and uh, I know that it is not uh, appropriate that uh, uh, to uh, use time for that. But uh, it is a, a great privilege that uh, God uh, bring you in our midst. Um, I remember that in a few years back, uh, I heard that, you know, Georgie was uh, mastered with uh, uh, his uh, uh, degree. It's a criminal justice. And he was working as a uh, uh, working as uh, for the state of Texas, and uh, and after a couple of years, uh, I think in the year before, I heard that you know, uh, George resigned his uh, job and you know uh, went to the theological uh, studies, and now he is uh, uh, working as a youth pastor in uh, New York, and uh, it is uh, very glad that you know God is using. Uh, in, in our younger generation to for his glory uh, we pray for you uh, to uh, may God bless you and uh, use you uh, as is a, a great weapon and a great tool in his hand and uh, we are so glad to have you in our midst welcome give him a uh, California well, welcome to them welcome to him may God bless you everyone can hear me Yes, yes, yes. Awesome, good. Um, honestly, I don't mind the uh, stories that you have, Joseph. And if you want to share them, you can always share them with me or with the rest of the church. Um, 
just want to say a good morning and happy Sunday um, to everyone there. I just want to thank uh, my uncle, Joe Swappen, like he just said, and the church for giving me this opportunity to share what God has been convicting and putting on my heart the past few um, weeks, months, uh, um, as I've been here in New York, um, just uh, using my time to uh, spread the gospel and uh, work in the ministry field. Um, and I just want to spend this time sharing those thoughts with you. And just like uh, uh, Joseph and said a second ago, uh, that's better. <laughs> and so I just, just like he said a second ago, my background, I did finish my master's in uh, criminology. I was working for the state um, as an investigation specialist. And uh, I was working full time. And at the right time, God uh, caught my attention and took the things I was chasing after to realign my focus towards him. And with that being said, he moved me to New York. And I was like, I don't know if that's the smartest thing for you to do, God. I don't know if New York is the right place for me. I'm not a city guy. I'm not a, I, I like my, you know, the Fort Worth, Texas, the countryside. I like the quiet. Uh, I don't like the busyness and the loudness and uh, the overcrowding of the New York. But um, he moved me there and called me out of my comfort zone into ministry, which on, honestly, I had no idea what that even looked like at the time. But uh, it's it's been almost two years. I'm uh, about to hit two years in September, and I'm on staff at a church called First Church of God in New York, and uh, I, I'm in charge of uh, like uh, Joseph just Wilson said. I'm the part of the pastoral team here. I'm foc my main focus is the worship, um, and I'm also on the ministry team as well. Uh, which led me to choose when, when Joseph and asked me to speak uh, this Sunday. It let, I was trying to figure out what to speak about and. Uh, I just found, found it appropriate to title this message, Pursuing the Will of God. Initially, I told them something else, so I apologize in advance. But the title of this message is Pursuing the Will of God. Um, really quickly, if we can all turn to Jonah chapter 2. Um, if you don't know the story of Jonah, I'm kind of going back to the uh, roots of some of our well-known characters of the Bible. Um, I know there's some kids here and there's some young adults here, but kind of kind of taking a step backward and talking about a few familiar names. Uh, we're going to be talking about David, Moses, and Jonah, but specifically Jonah. Um, if you go to Jonah chapter 2, it, it, most of us know the story. You know, he, he was called into the land of Nineveh, and instead he decided to turn a complete 180 and run as far as he could and ended up in a boat, ended up uh, in a storm, ended up in the belly of a whale, and then obviously God called him out in that moment and said, hey, I need you to really go and obey me. So we know the story. I'm not going to repeat the story. Um, and from there, if you once you get there, I hope you just put your finger on it and keep that place. We're not going to read this just yet. Uh, but as I was reading that portion, you know, sometimes we read the portions that we're so familiar with, but we haven't read the post part of it. We didn't we didn't read what the what Jonah went through. Because it says after he had uh found himself in the belly of the whale, he spent there three days and three nights and then pause. And then we never really talked about we never got into the the root of what happened in those three days and three nights. I don't think he was just sitting there and wondering where am I? I believe God was working on his heart. God was working in his mind and his spirit and in the flesh. And in that moment uh, I was thinking about my own life, how God's been working with, within my heart and my, my own mind. I remember a few weeks ago, um, I was on a phone call, and I was, in a such, I was in such a rush trying to leave my place to get to wherever I needed to go. I was grabbing my keys, my wallet, and then I, I remember I was on a phone call. And so as I was on the phone call, I started looking for my phone. And I'm, I'm like chasing after my phone. It's like, where's my phone? Where's my phone? While I'm on my own phone. And... Within like 30 seconds, I realized my phone was on my face and I just stopped and I started laughing at myself. I was like, wow, I, I had lost my train of thought that I started looking for something that was right in front of me. My focus, I don't know if, I don't know if anybody's done that. Maybe it's your glasses, maybe it's on your head or maybe the keys are in your pocket or you're looking for something specific and it's right there and you didn't realize that you were holding it. And you're like, man, I look, I'm embarrassed. No one's around me, but I'm embarrassed for myself or I look so foolish. I had that moment and I was like, man, I, I need to like maybe coffee or something. Something needs to uh, start over again, right? And so I realized, man, my focus had sank so much into the phone call 
the phone call that I was on that I had completely lost track of what I needed to get done for that day. My attention had been swept away so intensely that everything that was tangible, everything that was real, became obsolete. So my question for you this morning, church, is I wonder why we chase after God as if he had left us. I want you to think about that for a second. I wonder why we chase after God as if he had left us. If we think about, you know, we've heard chase after God, chase after God, go after him. Why are you chasing him? Chasing means that some, something is running away from you to the point where you have to run after it. Correct? If, if, if you're chasing something, that means it's so far, it's, it's going away from the opposite direction of you that you have to chase after it. And I realized, why am I chasing after God as if he had left me? Why do I run away from him when, he, when I know he has a plan and purpose for me? So I want to ask it in the context of the church. Church, I wonder why we chase God as if he had left us. And church, I wonder why we run away from him when we know he has a plan, a perfect plan, and a perfect, a perfect purpose for us. So let's go back to that finger that was on that scripture, Jonah chapter 2. And I'm going to read it out. It says, uh, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the belly of the whale. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. You threw me into the ocean depths. And I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth whose gates locked shut forever. I want to take a pause there for a second. We'll read the rest uh, in a bit. It's almost like Jonah was complaining, like, I, I did this, I did that, I, I, was, I was involved with this, I was involved with that, I was on my phone call, I was looking for my phone, and all of a sudden, it, it, all his emotions, all his, his struggles, all his troubles just engulfed him. He, he said it himself, and the waves engulfed me. How many times have we been in the position where you knew you're, you're in trouble, yet we didn't look up. You knew that you were going to experience some trials, but we didn't look to the one that we knew who would be giving us strength. So let's continue that verse 7, 8, and 9. Sorry, uh, six in the between six. It says, But you, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. And my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Then the Lord ordered the, fi ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. See, there's this very clear line where it says, But you, O Lord my God. So... I believe that we've been in the situation where we've uh, been in some trialing seasons. We've been, maybe this season is a trialing season for this. Maybe this season is a, is a moment where you've been asking God, how come this isn't happening for me? Or why hasn't this started for me? Or why have you ended this for me? Whether it be a job, uh, a, an opportunity, or I don't know what that looks like. I, I really don't. But maybe you've been questioning God and God's just asking you, hey, I need you to, to go down on your knees and spend some time with me in the quiet. Because I, I don't believe jo Jonah, for those three days and three nights, immediately started praying. I believe that first day he was like, oh man, <laughs> why am I here? What's going on? What, what's, go what, what's, what's all this going around me? He had to take a second and evaluate his heart, his mind, his, his, uh, his flesh. He had to evaluate himself, say, okay, what am I doing? Why am I here? There's a purpose and a plan for this. And immediately, I'm sure he had a breaking point. He says, God, I am done. I, I, I need to let my own plan, my own agenda for myself. And I need you to let, I need you to let you take over my whole, my whole walk, my whole lifestyle with you. And we've been in that. So I'm going to ask you again, why do we chase after God as if he had left us? You know, I, I said that we're going to be talking about a few other characters. Just very briefly. You know, in Psalm 139, David declares... Work.
can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. I cannot run away from you, he says. It doesn't matter where I go. I cannot escape from your presence. David said that. And Moses said the same thing. He said to God in Exodus 33, If your presence does not go with this, do not send us up from here. How profound that others were in the same mindset, saying, saying God, if, 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 if your spirit is not there, if your presence is there, do not lead me to that place. Do not lead me to that place. Because if, we, if, we're, if we're being pushed away from the, the presence of God, that means we're stepping out of the will of God. We're no longer pursuing it. We're stepping out of the will of God. See, when you're determined to go your own way, not only do you turn your back on the revealed will of God, you also become vulnerable to putting significance in things that are not related to Him. And that's what Jonah did. Jonah completely ran away from God and decided that even taking a ship would get him far away from God. And when he found one that was ready to take him, I'm sure he said, Oh, I'm definitely not supposed to go to Nineveh because look, a ship arrived. I hope that's convicting you, church, because I believe sometimes God pulls us a certain direction and something comes up in front of us and we're like, oh, maybe that's this is happening because I'm not supposed to obey God or I'm not supposed to be in the will of God. Or you see a situation like, oh, maybe that's supposed to be that way. Have you ever heard that phrase, it is what it is? Sometimes we say that, ah, oh, it is what it is, or I guess that's what it's going to look like, or I guess I'm just going to settle for this, or I'm going to settle for less sometimes. We've all done that. We've settled for less. We're just like, oh, well, I'm just going to go along with it. But what if God's saying, I don't want you to go along with what's happening. I want you to trust me that, you, that I know what needs to happen for your life. Amen. And so when he found the one that was ready to take him, I'm sure, like I said, I'm sure he said, I'm definitely not supposed to go to Nineveh. I mean, come on, I need a ship to flee. And here it is. See, as, as children of God, how many times have we done that? Where in our lives did we know that we should obey, but didn't because it didn't look rewarding to us? I'm going to say that again. Where in our lives did we know that we should obey God, but didn't obey because it didn't look rewarding? It didn't look pretty. Because only if society or our traditions, maybe even our culture says it's rewarding, then only it is. And, and I said that a little while ago. You know, I finished my degree. I had a full-time job. And I was finding reward in those things because it gave me a temporary satisfaction that I was being accepted by society. I was being accepted by tradition. I was being accepted by culture. It was great. I mean, I had a good paycheck coming in. I had a good apartment. I, I, was, I bought a new car. But then I realized there was a moment. Uh, obviously, there are some, there are some details I'm, living, uh, I'm leaving out from the time that I stepped away from my career to stepping into ministry. God really did transform my heart. When I say transform, I mean he took away a lot of things. He took away the things that I had an agenda for, that I had a plan for, the things that I thought this is what life is supposed to look like. And God will be okay with it. And God will be okay with it. But God wasn't okay with it. And I quickly came to the realization that I was stepping out of the will of God. So... Before I get into the, the, the context of the message, we need to learn to detect the voice that says, keep away from that place. Avoid a relationship with that person. Don't get into that. That substance won't quench you. That, the spirit isn't leading you there. Beware of finding a ship. It'll only take you on a journey that you will later regret. Imagine if we would allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us in such a way that we are aware of his voice. I mean, imagine if that you're in a crowd of people. I know right now we're not allowed to do that. We're, that's why we're online. But imagine if you're in a crowd of people and God called out to you, say, hey, son, daughter, I need you to come follow me. Will you be aware of his voice? How many right now, this is a rhetorical question, a question that you can ask yourself. How many right now, right in this very moment, if God appeared to you in a voice and said, Justin or or Nathan or uh, I'm just calling some of the names I see on this on this video, but uh, or, or, or Pastor or, or Jason or I need you to come follow me right now and I need you to take you to a certain place. I need you to obey me. Would you recognize his voice? How hard is that? 
Can you hear his voice? Can you say, oh, that is God speaking to me? Or are you questioning it? See, the thing is, God doesn't mind questions. He doesn't mind questions that you have. He's asking, do not question me. I hope that sinks in. He doesn't mind questions that you have in life. He doesn't mind the struggles that you have questions about or the doubts that you have. He says, are you questioning me? Are you questioning me? If we can get to a place where we say, God, this looks terrible, but I trust in you. So my first point, if you want to write this down, I have three points. I'm just going to be very um, cliche and staple about my three-point message, but I'm going to start with my first point. My first point is if you want to pursue the will of God, it means you have to forfeit your own plans. To pursue the will of God, number one, that means you have to forfeit, may mean surrender, your own plans plans. If we go to back to verse 9, there's a clear depiction of that. Jonah said, I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise and I will fulfill all my vows. I will offer my sacrifice to you with songs of praise and I will fulfill all my vows. When you say a vow to your, your spouse, uh, as some of you have prob probably already done, you, you surrender your own plan. So Jonah at that very moment said, God, I'm surrendering, and here's my vow to you. He sur you're, he's surrendering his own plans. So church, we need to surrender our own plans. You can, you can, to, to, to hear his voice and recognize his voice, you have to surrender. The thing is, sometimes we are the ones that tune him out. We do, you know how some of you have little children, and they might have a, a moment like, ah, I don't want to listen. Or you have my brother or sister, and they're like, I don't want to hear you. Don't talk to me. And they do this. But sometimes we do that ourselves. We put plugs in our ears and I, I, I don't want to listen because I'm too afraid. We're too afraid to go against what society or culture or tradition wants. And to be obedient to our Heavenly Father. You know, David says the same thing when he says, He anoints my head with oil and my cup overflows. The only way to forfeit your plans is to be anointed by the oil that God has provided. And I don't know if you know this, but as, you, as I was studying more about um, Psalms 23, and I'm, I'm sure some of you have already heard this, uh, this, this analogy. It's actually not an analogy. It's a real true example. When Sheep have this thing called a fly nose. That's when flies get into their nostrils on, on a dry or uh, moist day. And it gets so far up to the nose that sometimes it it uh, it leaves uh, their eggs in their the the sheep's nostrils and the brain. It goes as far as the brain. Sometimes, it gets so bad that the sheep get really frustrated. They almost go haywire. They they start panicking. They start hitting their head against tree trunks. They start hitting their their head against fence. They'll ram other sheep. They'll hit it against rocks. They'll to the point that they've some a lot of sheep have died. There's a thing called a shepherd that knows what be what's best to do. So what he does is he grabs some linseed oil and he applies it to the sheep's nostrils. So what happens is mosquitoes and flies don't want to nest in a place where there's oil. It's not dry, it's moist. And all of a sudden the problems are gone. The, th the thing is the sheep has to forfeit the instruction of the shepherd. So how many of us are ready to forfeit our plans this morning? You may have come with a plan today already. After service, we're all going to eat lunch, or you probably have to eat lunch already, or you ate breakfast, but you have plans. You're going to see this person, or you're going to go visit your family, or you're going to go out and about. Are we ready to forfeit our plans to our Heavenly Father so that we can pursue His will for us? Uh, my second point is, to pursue the will of God, it means you destroy worldly attachments. Um, if we can quickly go to um, verse 8, it says, Those who worship false gods turns their backs on all God's mercies. So I just said, pursuing the will of God means you destroy worldly attachments. And verse 8 says, Those who worship false gods turn their backs on God's mercies. Real quickly, I'm just going to jump to Isaiah 61.10. It says, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord, my God, 
for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding or a bride with her jewels. I'm just going to read that again. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. You know, when we hear, when we hear the word robe, we think of something very expensive. We think of something that's very, uh, the, the, the finest of fabrics that, was, that has ever been made. See, if you've all been to a wedding, the bride's dress is the focal point of the wedding ceremony. We all know that when the bride walks in, everybody stands up and like, oh, look at that, what she's wearing. Everyone's focus is on the bride. It's, it's the focal point of the ceremony. But the thing is, before she walks in, no one is allowed to look at it because it's only revealed when they're at the altar ready to say, let's do this. And I'm not saying you're not allowed to do this, but people spend thousands on wedding dresses for, to wear for like three hours and then it's tucked away at the top of a shelf. I'm not saying don't go buy your fancy dress. Hey, it's you know, one, one day to have a wedding, but go do what you got to do. But imagine if we took the time to work on ourselves and improve in the way we walked and identify with Christ every day, every moment, every breath, every step that we take. If all we ever did was take time to clothe ourselves with the things of this world or what we can attain or succeed at, aren't we just showing God the things that we are attached to versus bringing the best version of ourselves to our groom? Sometimes we forget the fact that we are the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. If we are robing and clothing ourselves with the, the things of this world, we are bringing the things of the world back to Christ. Instead, we should be bringing the best version of ourselves, our best heart, our best spirit, our best mind, our best ear, our best eyes. Saying, God, this is what I am improving on. This is what I am looking forward to. This is what I'm, I'm, I'm developing, this intimate relationship with you. So I can destroy the worldly attachments to pursue the will of God. We cannot pursue the will of God if our worldly attach, uh, the world is being attached to us. God is not all about that. I'm guilty of it too. I, I like my, my, my gadgets and my technology and all that stuff. We all have those things that we are attached to, whether it be clothes or, 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 or electronics or, or, or a show or things. We, we all have something. But the thing is, we can have things. I don't believe God wants those things to have you. Ooh, I, ho I hope that, that hits a note with somebody. You can have things, but I believe God doesn't want those things to have you. If they are having you, how can you pursue the will of God? We need to destroy those worldly attachments that are engulfing us, that are making us flee away from the, the will of God, from the presence of God. We just, we just heard that, that David said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. We need to get to a place where we're saying, God, I want to be in the presence where you are. I don't want to be in the presence of anybody else. I don't want to be in a place where that you are not. So we need to destroy the things that deter us from the will of God. He wants your trust. He wants your ob obedience, your constant fight to correct our posture. Some of us need to correct our spiritual posture. It's become a little, uh, little clouded. We need to correct our posture that we can, when we are faced with calamity, we can say, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That means we don't look to our own abilities, but we, to the one that gives us the strength. That leads me to my last point. It says, to pursue the will of God, this is point number three, that means you are aware of his presence. Let's go to verse seven of Jonah chapter two. It says, as my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. It just does two lines. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. And it's funny that Justin and the pa and Pastor had referenced this verse, Deuteronomy thirty one six or Hebrews. There's there's, there's twice that this this verse has been uh, um, talked about. But in, I, I chose Deuteronomy thirty one six. It says, "Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. And I want you to pay attention to the last part. He will never leave you nor forsake you." So when Justin was saying that earlier, I was like, oh, wow, that's, 
this has to be a reason why I'm speaking today, that that verse has to be exemplified today. He said, the Lord your God is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And I said that in the very beginning. What, I'm going to ask that question once more. Why are you chasing a God as if he had left you? The funny thing is, that's the one line that's been convicting me the past few weeks. If he's never left me nor forsake you, forsaken me, why am I chasing him? Why am I chasing him? See, initially when, I, when, when Joseph and I had asked me to speak, I told him my title for the message was Chasing God. But immediately I was convicted that why should I chase a God when the, clearly, when the word clearly says he will never leave me nor forsake me. See, oftentimes we are so caught up in chasing God, just as how I was chasing my phone for no apparent reason. It was right there. When in fact, he's never left us. If he was a God that left us, wouldn't we run to other things? Or wouldn't we run to people at times or start creating gods, lowercase gods, not uppercase God, lowercase gods, to run to and satisfy our needs? It says it in verse um, 8, those who worship false gods, and there's a reason why it's in lowercase. Sorry, verse uh, 8, yes. Those who worship false gods, lowercase, turn their backs on all gods, mercies, uppercase God. I think we have to show reverence to the moments where we understand who the true one creator is. It's not about those lower, lowercase gods that we're attached to. We need to start destroying that in the, in the name of the Holy Spirit. We need to claim the blood of Jesus over those moments. Say, God, I need to get rid of these lowercase gods that are attached to me. Because if I'm attached to those things, I cannot pursue your will. I will not understand who you are. I cannot be aware of your voice. I cannot recognize your voice. And I will be lost in those. I will be in the darkest pit. But the thing is, we have to trust God. And we have to also entrust Him. And I'm going to talk about that two words for a second. There's a, there's a difference between trusting God and entrusting God. So when you trust God, you just, you're saying, I trust God that you are who you are. But when you entrust God, that means you're entrusting Him with your life. Church, are we ready to entrust our life with God no matter what tomorrow looks like? Or maybe even the next hour might look like? You can trust God, but if you don't entrust your life with Him, how are you pursuing the will of God? You, I can trust my dad. I can trust my brother. I can trust my best friend. And there are some friends I don't entrust my life with for other apparent reasons. <laughs> we all have our reasons where we don't trust certain things. Like, I, I'm, I, I'm the worship pastor at my church. I will not entrust my guitar to anybody else Except, I don't think anybody's touched my guitar because it's a thing that I spend so much time on. I will not, anybody, no one will touch that guitar. And people know if they touch it, they're going to get a little face from me. You know, it's the one thing that I spent good, like my time and my money on. I was like, do not touch that. That's mine. Imagine if God said, if you heard God saying that to you, do not touch that. That is my child. Ooh, I hope that's, that's ringing a, some kind of, some kind of alertness in you that God every morning he's saying do not touch my son or daughter he and she is mine can we can we reciprocate that to our heavenly God of our heavenly father saying God is mine Jesus is mine he is my savior he's my redeemer he is the one that died on the cross nobody else not one other person would lay their life down for me only him and because of that, I'm going to pursue the will of God. See, I chose this message because I was also like Jonah. I, I very closely relate to him. I was constantly chasing and running after things I knew without a doubt wasn't for me. But it, 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 it always felt better at the moment. It was only until I truly surrendered my, my own agenda and plan in obeying God that I found true satisfaction that true quenching of the holy spirit i ran so far away that things became so obsolete to the point that i finally stepped into his will you see there's there were so many instances that the voice of god was so clear that i was too afraid or not even aware that he was calling me i'm gonna, I'm gonna end with a quick story so it was 
2018 um, August, right before I was leaving to New York. And I still had my doubts. Like, God, are you sure you want to use this guy? Like, I don't know if you've seen, I was like, I was like, God, I don't know if you know, like the things I've done or said, or I'm not, I'm, I'm not meant for ministry. Like, I don't think so. I think you got the wrong Georgie. <laughs> you know, I think there's, there's other Georgies out there. I think you got the wrong guy. I, I really said that. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making this up. I was like, you got to reevaluate yourself, God. <laughs> I think you got the wrong person. And I said that, but I, at the back of my mind, I still had this little hope. Okay, God, I just need like one more sign. Just, just reveal to me. All right. So like two weeks later, I, I was at home and my parents went to a fasting and prayer meeting. I had gone to like my brother's house or something. And I get home and my parents come home like, hey, can we talk to you? And I was like, yeah, sure. And they said, so some pastor from India had came visited the church that night. And at the end of his message, he had called my parents to the front. They've never met, ever. So my parents never met him. He, they, he's never met my parents. And he just randomly calls my parents to the front. And, and he said, there's someone in your family about to step into ministry. Do not stop him. How much clearer can God be to step into his will? Come on. How much more clear can God be? That even when I was doubting, he was trying to confirm it to my parents. I, need, I, I was thinking God would give me a sign, but he needed to give a sign to my parents. So my parents would say, hey, hey, I think we can finally send you. Because they were not on board. You know, I, at the time I was 27, I had a career, I had a degree. They were like, are you crazy? I'm like, I am crazy. You know, I probably am. But it got to a point that God needed me so badly. He needed me so intensely. He needed me to the point where he had to talk to my parents in such a way. He had to talk to a pastor to talk to my parents to talk, come talk to me. It was like a little train, you know. And I was so in awe. I, I, you know, when, when, they, when they said that, I mean, you know what my response was? I immediately got convicted because I was the one asking for a sign. I said, that's not for me. That's for you guys to have peace so that I can be sent. God couldn't have been any more clear to step into his will, to pursue his will. And the funny thing was he never stopped showing signs that I was in the right place. I have many stories in the past two years that has, that has happened Maybe one day I can share it, but I'm not going to share it for lack of time. But there's been many instances where I was like, God, are you sure I'm in the right place? And he, immediately he would send somebody or he would make a situation happen. Or he would, he would turn a, an entire day upside down just to reveal to me, I'm in the right place. I'm in the right place. You know, being in New York, New York is kind of expensive. So I do have a part-time job at a physical therapy clinic. And I'm just going to, I just feel led to say this because I, I believe God works in these ways to speak to you and minister to your heart. I'm just a very sh quick story. So when I moved to New York, I was like, God, um, New York is kind of expensive, expensive. Maybe I should look for a part-time job in the days that I'm not working at the church. And so I was looking around, looking around. There was not many jobs in my field. It was kind of far away. So one of my friends connected me with a physical therapy clinic. And um, he had reached out to the doctor because he knew the doctor. And he told the doctor, hey, we have this guy who's looking for a job. Is there any like, a front desk position? And I was like, I don't want a front desk position. Like, uh, that's, not what, you know, that's not what I want to do. But the doctor told the guy, uh, so that my friend told the doctor, hey, this guy's in ministry. He's just looking for something part-time to, like, make some ends meet. And, the doctor, and he said, he's in ministry. And the doctor, he was in ministry? Give him the job. Uh, so he gave the job to me, to my friend over the phone with him. So my friend calls me and says, hey, bro, you got the job at the physical therapy clinic. I'm confused. I'm like, what job are you talking about? And he goes, the job is the physical therapy clinic. I'm like, Jason, I'm confused. I didn't apply for any job. The guy has never met me. He's never seen my application or my resume. How did I get a job through you? I mean, he gave the job to you, to me, you know? And he goes, I don't know. Just go meet the guy. So the next day I go to the doctor's office and I'm sitting there, I'm sharing my testimony with the doctors. Hey, this, I'm actually in ministry. Mm -hmm. I don't want my job here to be the priority. I just needed something part-time. So I shared my testimony with him. We're talking about church. He's a believer. And then he's obviously, we had to talk about the, the job description. 
Um, and so he's talking about the, uh, the, the job description, what it's going to look like. And right before we started talking about the hours, in my mind, in my head, I didn't say this out loud. So just a little info for you guys. Mm -hmm. um, I have church office hours that I have to be in the office at church on Tuesdays and Thursdays primarily. And so in my mind, I said, God, do not touch my Tuesdays and Thursdays. I have to be at the church. I said that in my mind. So Dr. Jacob, the, the doctor's name, he looks at me, he says, so I, I only have a, a part-time position available. I know it's not gonna be enough hours for you, but that's all I have. And those hours are only available Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Mm -hmm. I, I stood there and I, I sat there in the seat and I was like, uh-huh. It, 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 didn't, it didn't hit me yet. I was like, uh-huh. And he was what? I'm like, wait, did you say Monday, Wednesday, Friday? He goes, yeah. I'm like, did I say anything out of my mouth? He goes, what do you mean? I'm like, did you hear me say anything about Tuesday and Thursdays? I thought I had uh, accidentally said, God, do not touch my tooth. No, I said it in my head. And immediately God fulfilled it and said, no, I'm only going to give you a, a job that's only available Monday, Wednesday, and Friday because you have to serve me Tuesdays and Thursdays specifically. So the thing is, we have desires and God wants to meet those desires, but we have to be willing to be in the will of God. We have to be willing to pursue the will of God. We have to be willing to be intimate. We have to be willing to be vulnerable to the will of God. Stepping into the will of God, I'm going to tell you guys, is not easy. I know, Pastor, you, you can say this. You can be a testament of that. It's not easy to step into the will of God. There's very unknown moments. There are very blind moments. I'm not telling church today, leave your job or leave your family and go into ministry. I'm saying He can use you where you are. He can use you at the very moment that you are asking him to use you as a vessel. You know, he said to the widow, go get your jars. I want to fill you. He wanted to fill even the emptiness in the widow. He wants to fill the emptiness in you today. So stop chasing God or lowercase gods and start pursuing the will of God. He hasn't left. He is there. But those three points forfeit your own plans your own agenda destroy those worldly attachments clothe yourself with the spirit of god and become aware of his presence amen so father god as we just wrap up here god i just ask that the words that were coming out of my mouth were only of your holy spirit god that you touch someone's heart mind and soul today that they make that radical transformation to pursue the will of god in such a vulnerable way god things look not amazing the next few weeks or months. Maybe things might look not amazing or pretty even today. Maybe things are in a confusing state of mind. But God, you have given us that peace that surpasses all understanding. It's that kind of peace that we don't have to explain. Meaning it's God that does the explaining for us. We don't have to say, God, God does it for us. So God, you take over. You cleanse us, you purify us, you refresh us and renew our every moment, God. You guide and guard our every step from here on out, God. Lord, I ask that you bless the church that they're able to reach even further, wider, deeper into your children, God. Even those around in their community, God, that they're able to connect with them and show them love. That they don't identify themselves with the things of the world, but they identify with the face of Christ. That when people cross their paths, God, they only see your face, not my face or the person next to them or the person on the other side of them. Only the face of Christ, Jesus, God. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity where I could share your word, God. Share my moments, my encounters, God, so that others can desire to have an encounter with Christ whether it be now or tonight or tomorrow, God, let, lead them in the process on a journey that they will never regret, God. That they will see that it's you directing every moment in their life, God. But we just want to thank you and we love you in this name, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.